I think at the very top, one of the things that has, I think we have to focus on is the problem that we face as it relates to social justice is that we think of it as a isolated incident, that it's just a police situation. But we have to really understand policing and education and jobs and housing um, all as leaves on a tree and the roots to that tree in America and around the world has been the system of white supremacy. And so a part of any manifesto has to address that history and the unwillingness for America to address the historical roots of white supremacy, which has been the enslavement of African people, is really just kind of tinkering. We're just kind of playing around the edges. Welcome to Mentoring Kings. Where do we go from here? A look at social justice in America. When I walk into a courtroom as a, as a black lawyer, I'm not just walking in there as Maoli Davis from the Davis Bozeman Law Firm. I'm walking in there having a clear understanding of what it has taken for me to even be able to practice law, for me to even be able to have my own law firm. So I'm walking with, with Johnny Cochran, with Chokwe Lumumba, with Constance Baker Motley, with Rome Powell, with all of those courageous, historic, ancestors who came before us and paved the way. Some like a C.B. King came into a courtroom and took a beating to be able to practice law. Um, those like Donald Lee Hollowell who were able to desegregate the University of Georgia and to confront and to free Dr. King who had been taken to work in a hard labor down in Reedsville. So I'm clear about the power and the potential of socially conscious black lawyers in this country and around the world. And so that's what um, affirms the decisions that we make, that we are on the right side of history. And when we're on the right side of history, the most high, our ancestors, bless our work. So we know the history, the, the importance of representing people with civil and human rights issues is that we know that as a people, our civil and human rights have, from the time we were forcibly brought here, have been not only infringed upon, but just literally taken away from us. And so we have to advocate, we have to fight, we have to try to awaken the consciousness of our community so that we can realize and recognize that our rights are being infringed upon, taken away on a daily basis. And there are people throughout uh, the United States that are experiencing police brutality, false imprisonment, racial profiling, things that you know we, we tend to write off, but they impact our spirit, they impact our soul. And so this is really for us, this is soul work. This is spiritual work. This is work that affirms that we have a right to be as a people, that we have rights that are worthy of protection and advocacy and fighting for just like anyone else on the planet. We represented previously Jesse Murray, who was a African-American man who was married to a white woman who entered a bar and while they were in the bar, he was threatened by a group of white men. He went out of the bar. They came out after him. Uh, he lawfully had a handgun. They attacked him, five of them. One was choking him. One was punching him. They were literally all over him. When the firearm that he had was discharged, ultimately killing one of them, and he was charged. We raised the no duty to retreat, stand your ground defense in that case. It was rejected by the judge. So the case ended up going to trial. And while we were in the middle of trial and we were cross-examining witnesses, they 
offered to dismiss all of the, the murder charge, the aggravated assault charge, and allow him to plead to just a possession of a far, firearm charge for probation, which he ultimately did um, with no jail or prison um, time involved. So these cases, what we found is that when stand your ground is something that is argued by a black defendant, they are not offered that as an, an immunity pr to prosecution. Simply put, when we put up black defendants, stand your ground as a defense, we don't often succeed with that. Whereas, as in George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin, the defense of self-defense self is one that was accepted by a jury. And, and, and there's, you know, it's very loaded. When George Zimmerman was acquitted, a group of us organized what at the time was the largest march in Atlanta from the Atlanta University Center where Morehouse, Spellman, Morris Brown, um, ITC, um, are, and Clark Atlanta are all housed. We marched about 5,000 people from there to the CNN Center. And then we just watched over the years this momentum growing and growing and growing. And it's unfortunate that it has to grow each time with another death. So after the Philando Castile death and Alton Sterling death, um, these are all kind of a culmination. And the young people have gotten to a point when they see George Floyd's life taken, they just had enough and they were in the street and have been in the street. So we have organized men to go out to serve as um, protection, to shield them from law enforcement. We have uh, supported efforts to recruit lawyers to uh, work with some of the existing um, groups to make sure that their legal rights are taken care of. We, our firm currently is representing Messiah Young, the Morehouse student who was tased along with his girlfriend from Spellman to Naya Pilgrim on live television. And so every time we see an abuse take place within our community by law enforcement during these protests, we are just trying our best to provide whatever support we can. One of the things that was really powerful was that in the moments that Messiah was being, and Tanaya were being assaulted and tased by these officers, Messiah made a statement to the effect that I'm not going to die tonight. And I mean, just, you know, in that moment to just have to articulate that. Here's a kid who's a college student, great family, whole future ahead of him. And he, during a police encounter, has to affirm his own life by saying, I am not going to die tonight. And that is the level of resolve that we have seen with the young people here in Atlanta and across the country that they are um, really done dying. You know, one of the things that we have to recognize is, and we talk about the need to go beyond just the, the defunding of police, but really the root of police culture is rooted in culture here in America. And that culture says that uh, black lives are worth less, that white supremacy rules the day. And until we address through some real serious anti-racist work rooting out the system of white supremacy, what looks like a neutral law will continue to be applied unequally because at the root is the culture of the concept of black inferiority and white superiority. And so you see that play out in the criminal justice system, but you see it in education, you see it in entertainment, you see it in housing, in economics, in employment. And so policing is just the most obvious aspect of how this system of white supremacy plays out, but it plays out in every aspect of our lives. And that is the great challenge. And that's why we have to go beyond just defunding and just dealing with a police issue but we have to look at the core issue and really dismantle the system of white supremacy that allows our lives um, to not matter.
When we look at historically the role that law enforcement has played in communities of color, pre predominantly black communities, they have served in many ways as an occupying force to protect other people's property over protecting the lives of black people in those communities. And so that's something that we have seen, um, you know, since we've again, since we've been here, the, the, the patty rollers who were going out attempting to recapture our enslaved African ancestors. And then you see the use of vagrancy laws and the imprisonment and incarceration of, of black people so that they could serve as convict labor. And then you see the mass incarceration and the so-called war on drugs. So policing has in many ways been a part of this industry that has sought to make a, a profit off of, off of black bodies. And that is something that, that's one of the reasons you hear this ongoing cry for defunding the police because we know the historic role and currently how it's manifested itself. I absolutely believe that resources that are currently allocated for policing should be reallocated. They should be deployed to social services and to education and to areas that we know have a much greater impact. The cost of criminalizing and the cost of the mass incarceration of black, brown, and poor people is one that we should no longer pay. We should redirect those resources to provide mental health, housing, um, all of the things that we know have substance abuse treatment. You know, these are the kinds of revolving door kind of, they're not even offenses, they're just uh, community needs that are not being met and that we really have overtaxed what police are supposed to uh, really be about doing, what service they're supposed to provide. When you have systems that are failing our young people in the way that the education system is failing them, then what do you turn to? If you, if you can't make it happen through the route that, that everyone says, here's the route that you take to have the life that you want to have, then people, our young people turn to other avenues. If they can't do it through education, if they can't do it through sports, if they can't do it through um, entertainment, then they take to the street and they become a part of the, the, this mass incarceration. And you know, so it's, it's our work. To, to dismantle the system. And it really is, again, rooted and grounded in, in the education. And we began then, in our very first Let Us Make Man, we, we, do work, we, we do workshops. So we didn't want it to just be a lecture series. We wanted it to be an engaging set of workshops. It was on education. It was on um, interacting with law enforcement. Um, it was on mental, um, your mental health. Um, so we had these different, these different workshops that were being done. And, and from there, we ended up with Black Man Lab. And the Black Man Lab is something we do every, every Monday now, where we were, before COVID, getting about 150 to 200 Black men together every single Monday um, to just deal with issues around manhood and to create that safe and sacred space to keep building. Because Black Man Lab is now virtual, we have been getting um, young men and presenters from all across the country. So we had um, Walter Bond, form, former NBA ball player who was also originally from Chicago. He was um, down in Florida. He was able to present a good friend of ours, Steve Carter, down in, in Dallas. Uh, we've had Ben Crump come on. Um, and so now that it's virtual and people can tune in via Facebook or YouTube, they're able to um, plug in from around the country. And then there's ritual involved where we just try to support brothers um, who have had a tough week um, by coming up and showing them love, showing our young men that we can hug each other, we can um, encourage each other, we can love on each other. Um, in a way that lifts lifts a brother's spirit up and makes sure that they're okay to to keep to keep moving forward in a healthy way. That's the beauty of Black Man Lab is that 
we have had men in the same space, a young man as young as five years old and an elder as old as 85 in the same space in every age in between. And then each Monday we discuss a different subject from it'll either be professional development or personal development or, or a raising of political consciousness. Tonight, for example, we will have uh, why um, black men voting matters. And so we'll have organizers who work in that space around uh, voting and voter suppression issues, discussing with our young men and all the men that are, that are gathered the importance of, of voting and what is at stake in this moment of our history, particularly in honor of, you know, Congressman Lewis and C.T. Vivian, who, you know, suffered brutal beatings to ensure the right to vote. And, 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 and quite frankly, I'm not a person who believes that voting will just solve our problems. Our, our problems are far too complicated that just electing a single individual or multiple individuals are gonna resolve what we're facing as a people, but it is definitely a part of, of the process, a part of the so overall solution. And so we're gonna encourage these young brothers to, um, to really figure out this political process and provide them information that can help them. This is the question I think that we have to get young people to ask themselves. Do they have any loved one who's ever been arrested? Any loved one who's ever been incarcerated or sentenced? And if the answer is yes, do they know the name of the judge that sentenced their loved one? Do they know the name of the prosecutor who prosecuted the case? And if the answer is no, then that's an example of us not being politically engaged enough because on a local level, the individuals that are elected have such an incredible major impact on how our lives are determined. Do you know who makes the decisions about um, whether or not there's going to be any affordable housing in your community? Those are usually city councilmen, aldermen, commissioners. And then when we talk about gentrification, so there are so many aspects because politics is really about controlling uh, the economics in, in, in communities. And so to young people, I say, if you want to be a part of helping control the economics in communities, you have to engage in the electoral process. And, and again, it's not gonna fix everything, but it's a part of the process. And the other thing that we've been trying to explain to our young brothers is that you all are the ones who will save this world. You will save this world. That, that black people, the originators of civilization, it's up to us. We are the most humane people on the planet. We have to return to ourselves in order to save the direction things are going. Because in leaving it up to other folks, we are giving up our own lives and our own futures when we have the power. And that's one of the things that to get a young person to believe that when all of these other images are saying you are the N and you're the B and you're the H and you're the, you know, the pimp and the, all of that, we say, nah, you're the solution. You're the solution to, to everything that ails this world. You're the solution. And it's our responsibility as educators and coaches because we are, as parents, we're ed at your education and your educators and your coaches is to bring it out of you. I know what's in you. And if we can help bring it out of you, we win. We win. Thank you for tuning in to Mentoring Kings. Where do we go from here? To learn more about future episodes, visit www.mentoringking.com and join the conversation on social media by following and liking at Mentoring King on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Join us for an all-new season of Mentoring Kings featuring actors Hill Harper from The Good Doctor, Lamont Rucker from Greenleaf, and National Urban League President Mark Morial. Let's change the narrative on black men in America. 